Welcome back to our next edition of the CBB Review Studio Podcast. I am Dan Siegel, joined as always by my co-host Ben Anderson. Before we get started, just want to remind everyone to subscribe to our channel here at CBB Review, where we have multiple shows, this one being the main one, CBB Review Studio. Be sure to subscribe. It costs nothing on your end and helps us out a lot. So be sure to knock that out. Appreciate it. We are going to talk about what transpired last night as we record here. And that was the NBA draft, but Ben and I are admittedly not NBA experts. We are college basketball experts. So we are going to, we're going to phrase our takeaways more based on how it affects the college landscape, what schools had notable storylines related to the draft, what groups of schools had notable storylines related to the draft. So Ben, what is your first college basketball related takeaway from this NBA draft that happened on Thursday night. Well, Dan, I think it has to associate with the top of round one. If you look at the first five picks, you only see one college player there, right? Two overtime elite players. Give, now, they are twins, but there's two of them. One from Europe, obviously, and Victor Weminiano, the clear number one prospect, and then one from the G League at night. Now, does this mean that college basketball is dead? No, I, I don't think so. Does it mean that there are more alternative paths than there ever have been to the NBA? Probably. Does it mean that we'll ever see this replicated? Maybe, maybe not. It's hard to say. What do you think about this, Dan? Well, we. I'll just give you a few stats on really how this went down. Because the top 10 picks, like you said, only five of them went to college. But the rest of the first round was all college guys. And 15 of the 25 guys that were selected in the first round were one and done. So it's not as if if you're a one and done caliber prospect, your best path is to necessarily go to the G League Ignite or Overtime Elite. Now, if you're a surefire top 10 pick, that's probably a good place for you. But picks 11 through 30 were all college players. Then we had a a handful more of G league ignite guys and overtime elite guys in the second round. But honestly, I'm surprised also that 15 of the 25 guys in the first round that came out of college were one and dones. I thought this trend would change a little bit because the thing about power conference schools is they're getting older. They're getting more experienced. And that's because of the transfer portal. That's because of the extra COVID year that has just the, the whole average age of college athletics being older. And that's still the case here in 2023. I'm surprised that 15 out of 25 are still one and dones because, because of all this, there's less room for freshmen to get their minutes and prove themselves at even the top schools in the country. Yeah. I think that is a good point. I think a counter to that would be that the NBA doesn't draft on production. It drafts on potential. Right. Mm-hmm. This is why you see players like Derek Lively, for instance, who was not a factor at well, obviously he was a factor at Duke, but it's not like he was he Drew was- Timmy. If the if they if the NBA drafted on production, we'd see Oscar Sheboy and Drew Timmy in the first round, but we don't because that's not necessarily what the league is looking for. So I'm not necessarily surprised that fifteen out of the twenty five are first round or uh, the first round picks are one and dones, but it is, you know, an interesting sort of pivot or um, offshoot of the fact that everything is getting older. What I want to touch on here, though, is the difference between Overtime Elite and the G League Ignite program, because I do think that the Overtime Elite, we just don't have enough data on yet. Yeah, they have two top five picks, but those are going to be outliers in any single year, right? The question is, what does it look like in 2025 and then 26? Right? Are they consistently getting at least one lottery pick a year? If so, that's a viable option. But I do think the G League Ignite program is something that I would, if I were a top 10 level recruit, maybe even a five-star recruit, something that I would have to consider because you are getting paid. They pay for your college after if you don't go pro. I think that's a huge benefit for a lot of for a lot of people when they're choosing this path. And you have the experience of playing with against professionals in real you know a real man's league 
for lack of a better term. So I do think G like G League Ignite is something that's interesting. But at the end of the day, if you want the uh, the social effect, right? If you want the popularity, college is still the way to go. And an interesting note is Wembanyama and uh, Wembanyama and Bilal Kulabali's team, the Metropolitans ninety two. Their team got swept in the finals because they're playing against grown men. So that that's kind of funny. One last thing on this segment, because you talked about, you opened it with, oh, is college basketball dead? I don't think that would be the case anyway, even if this, this trend goes to an extreme, at least for fans like us, because we don't watch college basketball because they are the most talented players. If we wanted to watch the most talented basketball players, we would watch the NBA, we'd be NBA super fans. At least me, I watch college basketball because they're, while they're still very talented players, I think it's just the overall most entertaining product, the most entertaining atmospheres, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. You're you're not watching college basketball necessarily to watch the next stars. You're also watching it to watch yeah. your rival lose, right? Or you're watching it to be with whoever you go to college with or to be to watch the team you grew up watching with your family, right? There's a lot of different reasons that aren't necessarily exactly the players on the court, especially given the fact that they're not going to be there for longer than five years anyways. And while we're talking more generally, I wanted to bring up the fact that six mid-major players were actually selected in this NBA draft, which is the same as last year. There were six last year. And just a stat to throw at you. Um, oh, no. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, six, six this year, six last year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, so the six players were Braden Pajinski from Santa Clara. He went 19th. Ben Shepard from Belmont. He went 26th. Maxwell Lewis from Pepperdine went 40th. Amani Bates from Eastern Michigan went 49th. And th- there's a whole underlying storyline behind Amani Bates, but he still qualifies as a mid-major player. Uh, Tumani Kamara, 52nd from Dayton. Jalen Slauson, 54th from Furman. So, yeah, back-to-back years, like I keep saying, with six mid-major players – and the trend, like I've I said in the previous segment, in college basketball is for mid-major players to produce at their lower caliber schools and then move up for their final couple of years or their final year at a power conference school. And why? So they can be showcased more. And in most cases, this is the right move. But the thing is, you you, you don't have to to be noticed. Like John Morant set that trend back in the 2019 or 2020 draft. It's 2019, 2019, 2019 draft. John Morant said that trend, but my point is it's now each it's now a trend. It's not like John Morant was just an anomaly and he was so talented. They found him. It's a better move to move up to power conference schools. You don't have to be noticed. And that continues to be proved by back-to-back years with six men majors. And, and frankly, you're seeing some situations where they move down and they still get drafted, right? Brandon, uh, Brandon Projemski started at Illinois and Monty Bates, obviously different story, but he started at Memphis, right? Mm-hmm. There are situations where it might make sense for you to move down just so you ha- can have that increased production and not be hidden behind veterans or what have you and end up with, with fewer points per game. And that's really a great sight to see. My question to you, Dan, yeah. is Santa Clara the new Kentucky? Because I think they are. <laughs> Two years in a row, they have top 20 picks. That's one of, I believe Jeff Borzello tweeted this out. It's one of five schools to have back-to-back <laughs> picks in the top 20, which is a crazy thing. If, you want, if you're want, if you looking out for someone else, Adama Ball, Arizona transfer, coming to Santa Clara. Maybe even, hey, this is UVA thing, but maybe Caffaro is going to find his way into the into the lottery next year. That, you think so? That would be crazy. But, um, yeah, let's see. They went... Oh, they actually ended up picking up their year last year. They went eleven and five in conference play. I thought they did a lot worse. Nah. And then ten and five in conference, twelve losses overall the previous year. So they were like a good team from a good mid major conference, but they're not like a powerhouse. And then like the other schools that the mid majors came from, Belmont, same case, Pepperdine, no. Eastern Eastern Michigan, no. Dayton's a Good A-10 school, but they didn't make the, the tournament. Furman did. Furman's probably the best mid-major of those schools. But it's not 
like when John Morant took his Murray State team to the dance, they were a big storyline. And Murray State has now been very good after him, a lot better than they were in the past. These are not schools that are getting on the national showcase. Yeah, no, I agree. I I think the bottom line here is it's sort of like if it's the if you build it, they will come factor, right? If you have the talent, NBA scouts will find you. Everyone is watching somewhere, and frankly, it benefits the scouts to get that big break, right? If they find an underrated guy and not aren't just recycling content over and over again. So they're looking they're on the lookout and they'll find you if if they exist. You know what I'm saying? So um Really just, I think another solid year for mid-majors in the NBA draft, I think, especially at the Combine, they performed well. When you look at players like Ben Shepard, really helped their draft stock, proving that you can go up and play against the big guys, right, from the Power 5 schools, or the Power Conference schools, excuse me. Um, it was an interesting it was an interesting draft from that perspective, I think. What do you want to go to next? You know what? We've made it through two segments without talking about the biggest story. I think of the NBA draft in the first round that is, and that is Cam Whitmore falling from perceived top five pick all the way down to number 20. The Rockets made out, got basically got away with murder here, right? They picked four a men Thompson. They could have picked Cam Whitmore at four and no one would have had an eye and they get him at 20 without even having, having to trade up just an incredible sequence of events for the Rockets. But Cam Whitmore isn't the only player who, fell because from a perceived higher rank um, because of injuries, right? That's That was the general topic around Whitmore. He had injuries and also maybe his interviews weren't great. I can't speak on that. I've never met Cam Whitmore, so I don't want to say things that I don't know about the, the guy. But that it's certainly disappointing, right? Um, and really just one of the worst parts of the draft, in my opinion, is seeing someone sit in the green room. For all that time, right? But he's he wasn't the only per, he wasn't the only player in that situation. Nick Smith also fell from being the number one high school rated p- uh, player in his class, and then Bryce Sensiball. You could make the argument that he was going to be in the lottery area probably midway through the college basketball season. Where, which one do you want to talk about the most here, Dan? Well, I, we could get to it more in a second. We could elaborate on that, but also this is not new news, but I just want to reiterate that I will never blame somebody for making a financial decision just because of what keeps being illustrated, the inherent risk of not taking guaranteed money and going back to school. Now these, in this case, these are like mostly and Whitmore's case, true freshman prospects, but going back like that that's just the whole point is if you're going to play basketball at a at a competitive level and you and you're not getting guaranteed money now NIL could help this but still that just I'm never going to blame anybody for making a financial decision and taking the money even if they could increase their draft stock etc taking their money while they have it yeah no absolutely i think that you see players like, I think Chris Livingston is a great example of this, right? He got a promise about a couple weeks ago from, from everything that seemed to cancel all his workouts. He didn't come back to the draft, right? And he ended up getting picked. Is this the right decision? Who knows? But he will forever be able to say he got picked in the NBA draft. And there's no guarantee that if he came back to school, he would have been able to say that right in 2024, although it might be likely. So I really agree with you here it is unfortunate that you have these situations though right yeah and then did did you have anything to add on Whitmore Sensabaugh or Smith I think Bryce Sensabaugh at 28 for the Jazz is a fantastic pickup I really do like that area frankly I like it more than their 16th pick of Keontae George um if you had told me you'd flip the 16th and 28th picks um, for Utah, I wouldn't really have batted an eye. So um, I really do like that pickup. He's an incredible scorer, and I do think he can get around on defense um, once he gets put in a little bit better of a system um, than he was in Ohio State. And Cam Whitmore, man, you've never we, – we, we rarely see anything like this from from a top five pick, right? Bull Bull, you remember Bull Bull, who gets picked in, what, 44 or something like that after being invited to the green room, but he was in top five. That's just an incredible fall. Yeah, and I feel like Bull Bull had much more clear 
established concerns than Whitmore mm-hmm. has as well. But yeah, I feel like th- these are things you see happen in the NFL. Like every year, somebody drops way farther. I feel like, and I might be wrong. Like I said, I'm not an NBA expert. I'm a college basketball expert, but I don't feel like this happens as often in, in the NBA. No, because you're not picking for for positional need like you are in the NFL, I don't think. Right? Because I mean you, you need it like if someone needs a tackle, they get in the tackle. And you know, know if a, you know if a team doesn't need a tackle, they're not gonna pick you. you I can convince yourself into picking anyone really, I think. I don't know. I'd argue. I mean, this is this is a completely separate topic, so we don't need to get into this. But yeah. I'd argue that you you're picking more for positional need in basketball than football. But let's move on to some specific schools. One specific school I thought was a big positive from this NBA draft. One was a specific negative. Let's start with the positive. I'm a good news first guy. Let's start with Penn State, and Penn State has two players that were actually drafted in this 2023. Jalen Pickett went 32nd. Seth Lundy went 46th. So nice little way for Shrewsbury to go on the way out. And something he could take with him on his next school at Notre Dame as a recruiting pitch. Yeah, absolutely. This is the first time Penn State has ever had two players drafted in the same draft, um, dating back to the – beginning of the NBA draft, even when it was more than two rounds long, this has never happened. I don't think we talk enough about how hard of a job Penn State is for basketball. Um, And just in relation to what Michael Shrewsbury did there, I think it was really, really impressive that he was able to get them to the tournament and to the round of 32, right, this past year. Just in general, I think he did a really good job. Uh, I think Seth Lundy is going to be a plug and play. You know, he, he kind of reminds me of of Chris Duarte a couple of years ago when he got picked, sort of this old, really older guy. Obviously, Duarte was picked, what, 13th, 14th. Seth Lundy's picked in the second round. But the older guy that you know exactly what you're going to get when you put him on the floor, I think that it has real value in the NBA, and I'm interested to see how it goes for him. And the only other Penn State player, another statistic for you, that was selected this millennium was Tony Carr. 2018, he was picked also, He was picked actually after, later in the draft than Pickett and Lundy were picked. So these are the highest two Penn State players picked in this millennium since 2000. And they get, like I said, they get two of them. And like, it's just something you got to appreciate as a Penn State fan. I know like maybe you're a little bit bitter that Shrewsbury left, although I feel like you have to understand like he, he's in a much better situation. I, I, I would be better too, because it's like, you're, you're still a big 10 school going to an AC, but like, you got to understand either way. That's, that's something nice to go, go out on. Absolutely. Now, Dan, who was your negative team in the 2023 draft? Yeah. I don't think this is very controversial, but UNC for the second straight draft has zero players selected and a little bit surprising. I mean, not, not surprising because I, I didn't go into the draft expecting UNC. Like, I didn't expect leaky black or was it Pete Nance to get picked, but a little bit just surprising. If you just take the storyline as a whole, two straight years for a program like UNC to not have a guy drafted and look, it's not, a horrible thing for their program given that many of their pieces or a couple of their key pieces, I should say are returning, including Armando Baycott and uh, RJ Davis. But it's interesting because a lot of this is a lot of, both of those are players. I don't think we're going to really be NBA caliber guys, at least RJ Davis, maybe he has the potential, but he didn't even test the waters indicating that, I, I don't think he was very confident in it. Obviously, there was Caleb Love last year. He's gone, and he might have NBA talent, but certainly has a lot to prove. And then Baycott, I mean, we'll talk about some of the undrafted guys, but he just doesn't fit the mold of a of a modern-day NBA prospect. So what are your thoughts on all this? Yeah, yeah. As you opened up, as you started talking, I began to form a take in my head, and I want to hear if you agree with this. Okay. North Carolina – is the perfect college basketball program and specifically college basketball. 
Yeah. You know how to win at the college level, and their pitch is getting you to the final four, not necessarily getting you to the NBA. Because if you think back, like obviously they have their fair share of draft picks, but it's not at the level of Duke or Kentucky or even Kansas, right, in terms of lottery, top five. That's not to say they're doing a bad job at North Carolina. Obviously, they're not. They just won a title in the past seven years and have been to the Final Four you know, multiple times since then. But if you're looking at if you want to simply be developed and go to the league as fast as you can, I kind of get why people are going to Duke or Kentucky over Carolina. What do you think about that? No, I totally agree because even some of the later Roy Williams teams, and I'm talking about like some of those teams that – won national championships were runners up yes they produced nba draft picks but these aren't guys that are going out and producing really high in the nba either it's not like you could like it's not like hubert davis could sit down with a recruit and be and list off all these guys that are having really good seasons in the nba that came from unc that that i i haven't really thought about that but that's actually very true like they they are the best they probably have the biggest discrepancy between in like the positive direction between college level success and NBA level success. Yeah, yeah. That's definitely a good way of saying it. But either way though, you expect UNC to have at least one draft pick in most know. years. So having um zero yeah. players drafted for for two straight is, is a bit jarring. And it'll be interesting to see if Hubert Davis can turn that around. I do think this streak will end next year though, um with someone Maybe Elliot Elliot Cadeau, that's a name. Um, He just reclassed, and he's going to be super young. But I mean, I've watched this stuff, and he's like, he's a highlight reel man. And I'm really excited to see what he does in Chapel Hill. But yeah, interesting, interesting case here with with UNC. Yeah, nine first rounders, ten draft picks overall in the previous seven drafts before these two that they've had their draft. Mm -hmm. So we talked about some of the schools that you know penn state good giraffe for them unc on no unnotable but notable because of that giraffe for them let's talk about a couple of the undrafted players that stood out to us because i'll I'll go based off of john rothstein's list because he listed a bunch and then i'll ask you who you want to talk about so oscar shibwe adama sonogo drew timmy jacob toppin turquavion smith Charles Bediaco, Mike Miles, Ricky Council, Azulis Tabellis, and Adam Flagler. Yeah, two two of these names stick out to me um, in particular, not because necessarily they were the most successful college players on this list, but because I thought they had a good chance of being drafted based off of their pro potential, and that's Turquavion Smith mm. and Ricky Council. If you remember, last year, Turquavion Smith had an excellent combine right? And he chose to come back to NC State. He probably would, would have been maybe late, late first round, early second, I think, if he if he left yeah. last year. Comes like back. Very, yeah. Gets undrafted. That's tough. Ricky Council, he's a prototypical wing size. 6'6", six, six, can, you know, sort of shoot, um, but like has a lot of skills that trans- tend to translate really well to the NBA. Um, obviously, they go, they both got picked up immediately. I believe both by the 76ers, if I'm not mistaken, um, on two-way contracts. So it's not like they're just out of the league, right? But those two were stuck out to stuck out to me. And I'm sure you have thoughts on the the college stars that didn't get drafted, but those yeah. were interesting from an NBA perspective. I mean, I, I like I think I said in the last episode, I don't think Oscar Shibway was going to be drafted, and he did not. And Drew Timmy and Adama Sanogo, but it's always notable to this was a point you just brought up to talk about how college production doesn't equal NBA production. It's more about potential equaling NBA production and how hot of a commodity you are for NBA organizations to, I look, I didn't like closely look at a million mock drafts. So I wasn't sure if Tubelis was going to be drafted, but I feel like when, he has enough of a skill set like running the court as a big that I felt like he could have been a commodity in the NBA. Flagler too because he's more of a guard that could like create off the dribble. Not guys that I think are going to turn into NBA starters, but to not be drafted, that's definitely 
something to talk about. But yeah, I think I think Smith's the most notable one just because we were talking about is he a borderline lottery pick? He's going back to school, getting himself to a surefire lottery pick, and then he goes down. And that's where I opened up the episode. You gotta if you gotta make a financial decision, take the money now. And I, I won't blame you for that. No, absolutely. One last name I'll throw out here, uh, Colin Castleton from Florida. He missed the last part of the season with a broken hand. But I do think he has the skills to play as a big man in the NBA. I think that's something uh, teams are looking for um, in terms of his versatility. And if he can shoot it, if he can like prove that he can consistently shoot it from NBA range, that would be an interesting pickup as well for uh, – maybe a G league team or even just see what he does at summer league. But that would be my last, last guy that I threw out there. All right. And that will do it for today's episode of the CBB review studio podcast. Please be sure. Like I said, in the beginning to subscribe, if you have not already, a vast majority of our listeners are not subscribed. So we would like to change that. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening and take care.